Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, this animation here is satellite infrared temperatures going back over the last day or so, and we can see quite a bit of convection happening in the middle part of the country and in the lower Mississippi River Valley. We also saw storms pop along the high plains, and you can also see the very northern edge of what we're going to talk about here in a few minutes, which is um, Cristobal, Tropical Storm Cristobal. Now, as I was watching this animation, I noticed some pretty interesting behavior across parts of Missouri and Kansas. And that was where this frontal boundary was kind of pushing to the south, coming off the remnants of storms yesterday. And when you look back over the last couple of days in terms of total accumulated precipitation, it's really been a story of who's been getting those thunderstorms and who have not. Because locally, we produce some incredibly heavy rainfall, as you can see in this map, which shows you the last two days of total accumulated precipitation. But what I was fascinated with was here. And early this morning, as I was watching this, I also noticed that the National Weather Service out of Kansas City was talking quite a bit about it as well. Because this time of year, we often find that our thunderstorm activity, and as a result, our very heavy rainfall, is a result of um, the outflow, the decay, the, the, the um, origins of another thunderstorm that produced new ones. So what you're looking at here, well, I want you to watch boundaries like this one right here. That's the outflow from these thunderstorms, and it's propagating in this direction. Now you can also see another cluster of thunderstorms here, and it's hard to tell, but there's a boundary sitting in there as well. Now why I show you all of this is because as I animate this, you see all the boundaries kind of coming together to produce this massive event of extremely heavy rainfall. And we've seen that a lot across the midsection of the country and in parts of the lower Mississippi River Valley over the last couple of days. It's just amazing to see all of this come together to produce uh, not only a lot uh, of, of very heavy rainfall, but um, some severe weather as well. In fact, just looking back over the last couple of days here, on the left I have the steer, uh, severe weather reports from the second, and on the right I have them from the third. What was interesting interesting was what these thunderstorms here produced their outflow which traveled south which initiated these thunderstorms here which you also saw building toward the west at times meeting up with active thunderstorms in the central part of the United States and so when you put the two days together we're talking about 700 reports of severe thunderstorms including some nasty ones that went through parts of Pennsylvania a strong squall line here that knocked out power for a lot of people okay so adding it all up, we had over 320,000 lightning strikes from uh, the last 48 hours or so from these thunderstorms. And even early this morning, we can see uh, this is through about 4 o'clock this morning. You can see where those storms are still pressing through parts of the central United States. Now, something to think about here. Florida, over the coming days, we've already had a lot of thunderstorm activity as of late. And we are expecting a whole lot more rainfall as Cristobal finally comes out of the tropics. We're going to talk about that in just a few moments. But this got me thinking about something. And I got a great question yesterday after one of our videos about sunlight. Specifically, there's been a feeling across, especially parts of the Corn Belt, uh, where we've had just a lot of cloudy days. And some of the National Weather Service offices have been reporting uh, how cloudy things have been. So I generated a map to kind of show us that. We noticed that right in through this quarter and again up into parts of the Canadian prairies and in, like in Northern California, uh, we've seen some regions across the country that have just seen a lot of cloud cover. And specifically right in through here, here. Iowa, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, the month of May was quite cloudy. And because of that, uh, we have had kind of a lack of early season sunshine to get this crop really going and coming out of the ground. And we're behind on growing degree day units there as well. But as I was looking at this image, I decided to kind of blow it up and show it to you globally because there's a few things I think that are worth pointing out. I've kind of identified them here with a few arrows. Let's start off first and let go all the way over to the left-hand side of this image. And notice that when you get north of the Black Sea, which is right in through here, much of Ukraine, much of the uh, Russian wheat belt, also seeing a lack of sunshine, where, whereas Western Europe has been much, much, much sunnier compared to average. Uh, then get over here to the growing areas north of the Korean Peninsula. The start of the season has also been quite cloudy and below normal on sunshine activity. But one thing I really want to address is what's happening right here, okay? In the North Pacific, a lot of recent cloud cover has has, um, in this area has allowed the sea surface temperatures to drop off, while a lack of cloud cover off the Baja has allowed the sea surface temperatures to
to really build back up. And we can see that here. One of my favorite maps from Tropical Tidbits showing you uh, ocean temperatures. Well, we know we've been discussing this developing La Nina and its interaction with the warmth here in the North Pacific. But if you just look over the last week where all that cloud cover has been, we've dropped off temperatures here, allowed them to build in this area. And in our El Nino region, while we're still seeing um, you know, the, the cooler water emerge, the La Nina event that's been developing does take a little bit of a bounce right here. And that's partly been because our trade winds, which have been strong, recently kind of slacked off a little bit and even had a westerly wind burst over here. But this is normal when we watch the development of a new regime in the Central Pacific to see it kind of bounce around a little bit. But it'll be critical to watch as it's going to be an important component, especially to our late summer temperature patterns across the United States and what's going on in the tropics. So speaking of the tropics, latest information here from the European model. This is from the Zero Z Run. It's been very consistent taking crystal ball about five days from now into parts of Louisiana uh, and then eventually just along the western edge of the Mississippi River getting this over into parts of Arkansas, Missouri and then eventually the remnants into Illinois. The National Hurricane Center is also keeping this at tropical storm status so not getting up to hurricane status uh, but then bringing quite a bit of rainfall not only into this quarter but also to the east of it as well. I'll show you that. The uh, GFS interestingly enough uh, has kept with this same configuration up to about day seven where it tends to split this off and send it either possibly over into uh, uh, the Ohio River Valley or like the European tries to keep it coming here a bit farther to the north. So uh, what's changed is the westward trajectory of the track over the next five days, which uh, has come into alignment with the European model. Still, it's five days away from getting to the coast. We have a lot to be watching here. So let's take a close look next Monday morning as to where the system has made its progress. Now, in terms of total accumulated precipitation, I hope you like this map. I added two contours to it and showed it yesterday in my long range outlook. What I did was I put a, a contour here to show where we have 0 0.5 inches or greater. And then the second contour, which I'll kind of outline right in through here, for example, where we're talking about greater than an inch and a half. And what we do notice is that potentially quite a bit of rainfall, maybe up to five inches of rain could be falling in parts of Florida over the coming days. And this corridor right in here through the Delta getting up the lower Mississippi River Valley, quite wet. Notice the Canadian prairies wet and thunderstorm activity in the high central plains. Got to talk about that and how those storms are going to progress to the east. Because when we compare this to normal, this is how things look. So we're drier in the south central plains. And remember, later on today, there's a brand new update from the um, uh, drought monitor I want you all to take a look at. We're drier over in the Carolinas, dry in the northeast, as you can see, or at least drier. But outside of that, a lot of the places here are seeing quite a bit of precipitation as we progress through the you know end of the first full week of, uh, of June here. Okay, in terms of severe weather, later on today, look at the map that's in the upper left here. We're going to be watching a broad sector across the midsection of the country for severe weather, including the Dakotas over toward parts of Iowa. We're going to watch again down here in Texas, Oklahoma, and storms once again going through parts of Pennsylvania and the Mid-Atlantic. As we work our way into the day on Friday, things calm down a little bit before they get reinvigorated on Saturday with this deeper trough that pulls out of the northwest and out ahead of it destabilizes the atmosphere in parts of the high plains in the north central part of the United States. This will then continue into Sunday, kind of in that same area. This is our severe weather index looking out to Sunday. Going to watch that very carefully uh, as well. And you can see that on Sunday, maybe the northern periphery of what will be uh, the tropical storm coming up here, possibly in increasing chances of severe weather down in the south central part of the United States over toward the lower Mississippi River Valley. Now, this pattern is just amazing. I want you to watch it with me here. As I click play and let this move forward, we can see a sizable ridge in the midsection of the country, and the heat is on. Here's Crystal Ball. Watch this trough, which started off way down here off the southwest corner of California, sweep through and wrap its way around the much deeper trough coming into the Pacific Northwest. So this means over the weekend, very unsettled weather in the Pacific Northwest and in Northern California. But the leading edge, that trough right there, which came out of California, sweeps north. And with it, a lot of unstable air. And we're going to watch this area again Saturday and Sunday for this severe weather. You can see it sweeping around there. Oh, really cool to see that. 
Now, the thing about this pattern is that downstream um, omega pattern we saw setting up, it's, it's moving slowly. And as it does so, it lets the whole pattern move with it. So by next Tuesday into Wednesday, as Cristobal, watch it there again, gets pulled through Louisiana and then into this deeper trough, that trough sweeps in next week and cools down the midsection of the country, which had been quite warm. And as I even play this all the way out today, let's just get all the way out to day 10 right here. We still see several waves across the northern hemisphere. I count one, two, three, four, five. We can technically call this a five wave pattern. And generally those patterns continue to move, which means they resist getting blocked up for a while. So we've got a lot to be paying attention to here. Let's do a bit of a model comparison. On the left, I have the GFS operational 00, and on the right, I have the European. As we play this forward, let's pause it right there. Sorry, let it go a little too far. So as we move forward throughout the day today, this is now working our way uh, into, uh, here we go, this is now Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon and evening. Again, we're going to be watching in through this area the chance for strong to severe storms right in through here and a lot of unsettled weather down in Florida. As we then progress into Friday morning and Friday afternoon, we see there's a broad sector here in both models where there's going to be quite a bit of thunderstorm activity. But remember, Friday uh, was our day where things, I think, calmed down a bit compared to the severe weather we've seen as of late. Now, we can see both models are kind of honing in on the position of Cristobal here, just sitting somewhere right off of the Yucatan Peninsula, getting into the Gulf of Mexico by the time we get into Friday night. Working our way now into uh, the overnight hours on Friday, look at the low that's emerging here in parts of uh, Montana. Both models picking up on it. Very strong winds through the high plains here, getting up in the Canadian prairies. And uh, on that, that's where we're going to watch our severe weather event, possibly on Saturday. So this is Saturday afternoon and evening, and there it is. We're going to watch right in through this corridor for it. Meanwhile, a lot of unsettled weather in the Pacific Northwest showing up in both models, but extremely windy in through this corridor. You can see it here. Meanwhile, this is now Saturday. Saturday evening, look at where the models have placed crystal balls. So still the GFS a little farther north, but overall a very similar picture. Watch that northwest quadrant, excuse me, northeast quadrant of crystal balls to having the heaviest rainfall. So while all the action here over the weekend goes up into the Canadian prairies in the north central United States, we're going to have to watch a big gap of drier weather between that and crystal ball coming in from the south. So here we are Sunday afternoon and evening. Both models bring it on shore somewhere near Louisiana. As we work our way into Monday morning, again, dry in between the two areas, as you can see here, but this is going to be pulling this farther to the north. Now, currently the models are trying to bring Cristobal into Arkansas and meet it up at the front that'll be sweeping through the plains. So that's why we saw that severe weather Saturday, Sunday, then eventually the storms moving east on Monday and into Tuesday. And the GFS sweeps it qu more quickly up through the central corn belt than what the European does on Tuesday. But the changeover by next Wednesday, bringing in much cooler and unsettled weather to the middle part of the country with the GFS a little bit faster with the progression than the European here. Look at what happens up in parts of like Manitoba, getting over into, uh, you know, Ontario. We're talking about some snow in here from the models. But the thing is, is with that pattern sweeping everything out, we could go back over drier as we look out into week two. So why don't we do that, okay? Here is the next week's worth of precipitation from the uh, European, showing exactly the things we just talked about. Here's what the GFS shows, okay? A little bit different scenario, but you can kind of go back and forth and see some of the similarities. Now going from here into week two, I want to show you the upper level pattern first. Both models have come into much better agreement now, if you watched my video yesterday, about the position and tilt of this trough. And as a consequence, they've both now shown much more similar week two precipitation patterns. So a drier bias here. Now, is it so dry that we're starting to worry about major drought? No, no, no. This is just a drier bias in week two as the jet stream builds into that, well, trough ridge trough pattern. What is majorly different in the models is what's going on here with the GFS wanting to really keep the tropics cranking and the European having nothing to do with it. So that's something we're going to watch very carefully into week two as well, which takes us out to the 18th of June. Now let's talk temperatures as we near the end of this video. Another scorcher today in the central plains and over here in the central valley of California. So we've got some really high heat building. Desert southwest will top out around 110 near Phoenix. Playing this for, let's watch the temperatures evolve into Friday. As we go from Friday here, still triple digit heat possible in the south central plains through here. Much, uh, much similar pictures to what you just saw uh, on the day on Thursday. 
But as we get from Friday into Saturday, the deeper trough begins to build in the west. This is what keeps the north central plains unsettled here. But as we go from Saturday into Sunday, look at the cool down we have down here with the cloud cover from Cristobal. Look at the cooler weather in the trough in the northwest, the heat in the central plains in the trough. Look at this major temperature swing Sunday here in the western United States. Playing this forward, let's go to Monday. Now watch the central plains take over as the cooler spot. Ready? Tuesday and into next Wednesday. And that tends to last. Look at the six to 10 day pattern here. This is that mid-month break we were talking about. Both models, the GFS and the European, picking up on a very similar pattern. And because they've come into alignment better with day 10 and beyond, they do agree on what we're seeing all the way out to, uh, to the 18th of the month. We're going to have another, you see it here? Another setup where the planes warm up again. And if the pattern stays open, the heat will be on for about a week and off about a week. And that's what we're going to watch carefully to see if that occurs. As I talked about in yesterday's long range update, there's several moving pieces. The most important of which I think right now are the global wind anomalies, specifically the wind anomalies in the North Pacific. You can watch that video to get some of those details. To finish this up, I want to talk internationally. Uh, this is a time series going back the last 180 days on what's been happening in Ukraine. And we can see that from uh, parts of March, April, and May, right in through here, things were very dry. In fact, they went several days here in early spring of dry weather. Throughout the month of May, though, we've had a lot of bigger precipitation events, and they've recently recovered. But the questions remain, what does the subsurface soil moisture look like? We've had some late updates here from uh, satellite that suggest that it doesn't look that great. But when we look out over the next 10 days or so, all the action is going to be over here in parts of Western Europe. And we see if the Black Sea is right there, we see that much of the Black Sea growing areas are showing up with a drier bias as they begin to warm up. So the warm up is going to be welcome given the, la uh, the lack of heat early, right? We saw that at the beginning of this video. Uh, but we need to just question how much moisture is in the soil across Ukraine because with the drier pattern coming and the dryness we did see, uh, you know, throughout much of spring, it's just leaving some open questions here about what's going on in the Black Sea growing areas. We can at least take a look at how things compare to last year. And in general, we see across Ukraine near average, well, compared to last year, similar uh, vegetation health index and some locations lower. You can also see France and the UK showing up with below last year's vegetation health. One last graphic to show you. We're still once again seeing very heavy rainfall in the models showing up here in parts of southern Brazil, Saparna and Rio Grande do Sul, where we're growing a lot of that safrina crop here to the north, very, very dry, and also parts of Argentina dry as well. Okay, we'll wrap it up right there. Hope you all have a great end of your week and weekend, and uh, we'll keep a close eye on all of these things and report back to you next week. All right, have a good one. Thank you.